Darlie Newman, and I'm here in Monk's Corner, South Carolina, and we are taking a trip back in time, exploring sites related to our nation's founding and the American Revolution. So join me and a cast of very interesting experts as we explore small towns, big cities, busy great restaurants, and more. Welcome to Travels with Darlie. We're on a revolutionary road trip to share South Carolina's lesser known stories related to the American Revolution. During this tumultuous time in our nation's history, South Carolina became a hotbed of activity. After failures in the North at landmark battles like Saratoga, British military strategists turned their attention to the South, where they hoped that large numbers of loyalists might side with Great Britain and the King. What they didn't bargain for was the craftiness of the patriots and the conditions of the Southern climate, among other challenges. During the Southern campaign, the tide of the American Revolution would turn. We're exploring sites related to this history from Charleston to Berkeley County and meeting people whose stories are not even in the history books to help further understand the history of America. We're starting our journey at the Charleston Museum, which was founded in 1773 and has rare artifacts from that time period, including the Siege of Charleston, the largest battle fought in South Carolina during the Revolutionary War, and the longest siege of the Revolutionary War, even longer than the siege of Yorktown. Carl Borick, director of the Charleston Museum, is showing me some of those rare finds to give further context to life in Charleston for those who fought in the war. The Charleston Museum is located uh, right between the lines, the British and American lines from the Siege of Charleston. Why did the British come here in 1780? Well, in 1778, France is going to enter the war on the side of the Americans. Uh, it's going to change the nature of the war for the British. They're no longer trying to subdue a colonial rebellion. They're facing the French now around the world. So uh, British understand there are large numbers of loyalists here in South Carolina, and that's one of the reasons they come here in the spring of 1780. You know, some of the objects that we have in the museum are related uh, to the Siege of Charleston. This is one of the most impressive pieces that we have in the collection. This is a cartridge box that belonged to the Royal Artillery. Uh, appropriate to Charleston, though, because the Royal Artillery did serve here during the Siege of Charleston. And we have the copper nesting pots. So that kind of a uh, piece of equipment, those nesting pots, would have been critical to, to keeping the army in the field. So how do you come across this, these types of artifacts? Here in Charleston, because it's, it stayed a you know, small to mid-sized city, a lot of the historic district has been preserved. And that gives us the opportunity to do these archaeological projects and find things that you might not find that, that would have been destroyed in other cities. We're heading over to the Hayward Washington House, a historic Georgian-style home built in 1772. It was the home of Thomas Hayward, Jr., one of the four South Carolina signers of the Declaration of Independence. So, Darla, we're walking into the uh, kitchen building of the Hayward Washington House. The kitchen building was uh, the primary uh, quarters and, and workplace of the enslaved people that were here, uh, that were enslaved by the, by the Hayward family. Many people think about slavery in the South and they think about vast plantations and slaves being there, but they were also here in the city in this urban environment in Charleston. So at the time of the Revolutionary War, you have 12,000 people in Charleston, 6,000 of them are enslaved people. Those are people who would have served the households here. Um, they would have acted as butchers. They were here preparing food. They were you know, acting as household servants to the uh, wealthy families that lived here in Charleston. A lot of what we know about the, this building and, and the main house uh, comes to us from archaeology. Uh, there was a major project that was done here in the 1970s by uh, Elaine Harold. She recovered approximately 88,000 artifacts related to the history of the house. 88,000 artifacts being collected. That's a huge amount to go through. And now I understand why you have millions in your collection over at the Charleston Museum. The archaeology has really provided us a great snapshot in, into the lives of the people who lived here. It's interesting to think about what we know about the past and why, and what we know about the American Revolution, especially as archaeologists and researchers are still uncovering remnants of the past. I'm heading over to meet historian Doug Bostick to learn more about the Siege of Charleston at Fort Johnson, located on the northeast point of James Island. In 1775, Charles Coatsworth Pickney, Bernard Elliott, and Francis Marion attacked the fort with little resistance. They raised the new South Carolina flag over an area that was previously controlled by the Crown. So, Doug, 
this is quite the vantage point here. You can see easily why Fort Johnson was first built here in 1708. It commands the entire inner harbor and protects the city of Charleston. So how important was Fort Johnson during the American Revolution? Extremely important. Uh, it controls the whole inner harbor. So whoever held it, patriots and then British, and then at the very end, patriots again, whoever held Fort Johnson controls Charleston Harbor. What role did it play in the siege of Charleston? In the Revolutionary War siege of Charleston, the British are controlling Fort Johnson. The British surrounded the city by land, and General Lincoln, with all the Patriot troops, are inside the city proper, and they could not escape by water because the harbor sealed off by Fort Johnson. What does Fort Johnson mean to you today? Because you come out here and you're near West Picnic here and, and you do enjoy this space in this area. I come here not only for the fantastic view and all the boats going by through the harbor, but this place is steeped in history. Huge Civil War activity. The first shot of the Civil War on Fort Sumter is fired from this place. And Charleston would not have survived the three centuries were it not for Fort Johnson. James Island is known for its abundance of fresh seafood. I'm making a stop just a few minutes down the road from Fort Johnson at the Charleston Crab House, which has been welcoming guests to its location on Wapo Creek for decades. I'm about to dine here at the Charleston Crab House. They have something called you hook it, we cook it, so you can bring your fresh fish, whatever you've caught that day, and they'll cook it over you. Now, I didn't go fishing today, but I'm still gonna eat. <laughs> this is the classic low country staples. I'm gonna try today, shrimp and grits. We've got the crab dip, which they serve cold here, made with the blue crab that sometimes comes right off of the docks right here. Let's try this. So good. It's creamy, it's spicy. It's got a Cajun sauce and that shrimp. It tastes really fresh. When you come down to Charleston and South Carolina in general, I mean, you just have to be prepared to eat because like that is like one of the pastimes here. And it is a good one because the food is really good and you can't beat these views. Originally inhabited by American Indian tribes who lived along the coast of the Atlantic Ocean in what is now South Carolina, James Island was explored and settled by the British in 1760 a name for King James II of England. James Island would become one of South Carolina's famous sea islands because the cotton produced here was so much more valuable than upland cotton. McLeod Plantation specifically tells the story of the enslaved people on James Island Plantation. And Toby Smith, who throughout her life has found comfort in discomfort, shares the story. You are on the remaining 37 acres of McLeod Plantation. It was once 1,700 plus, fifth largest plantation on the island, but certainly one of the most prosperous. We remember the McLeods because of Sea Island cotton, but the truth around the cotton is hmm. they got the glory, but people who looked like me were doing the planting. And the Africans here came from Senegal all the way down to Angola and going into the Congo. And they did not forget who they were. And what you see around us is what's left of their handiwork in this particular property. What was life like for them? We know that things were awful all day long. People were in the fields 15, 16, 17 hours a day. On top of that, they had been stripped from their family, stripped from their culture. Women here were subject to all types of violations, sexual down the line. Children were sold. People were hung and lynched. A lot of horrific things happened here. But one of the things that has maintained the richness is the Gullah Geechee culture, of which I'm very proud to be a part of. Key to understanding Gullah is to understand the water. And the body of water ahead of us is called the Wapu Creek or the Wapu Cut. That is where those Africans would have been brought when they came here, they were not speaking the king's English. They were speaking their mother tongues. Ooh, and Tree, and Fonti, Wolof, Nereri. All those languages would end up in a big pot to be called Gullah. So it is the language of the people. And then Geechee. 
Geechee can mean you're from South Carolina, you're from Georgia, but it also better mean there's some rice or some grits somewhere in the equation, because that's a key part of our staple. So when you say Gullah Geechee, you're talking about the language, the people, the culture, the warmth, and the ambiance. It really has changed the world. One of the fascinating pieces on this property is this building. It's called the Gin House. The bricks were made at about five or six other brick-making plantations, and we know that the people who were trapped there had to make between five and 6,000 bricks roughly a day. Wow, that's a lot of bricks. That's a lot of bricks. The men built the kilns or the ovens. The women and children had to stir what I've come to call the brick gunk. And then the children had to help shape and mold the bricks. I want you to look right here. See these? Are these little fingerprints? Those are the fingerprints of our enslaved babies. Oh my gosh. And what we believe is that the children had to turn the bricks over in the sun so they could dry. They would get too heavy for their little hands and they'd squeeze too tightly resulting in those finger marks. This is the smallest one of the babies. This wall is where so many of our guests just completely fall apart because it's hard enough to think about slavery, but then you're thinking about kids as young as these, and it just gets to be too much. We also know these bricks have been found as far away as New York and Pennsylvania because they were sold. Everybody was making money off the backs of black men, women, and children. And so when we come to this wall, it's a reminder, who built this place? Who is it resting on? And not just this place, yes. but apparently buildings all over. Exactly. The U.S. as far up as New York City. There is a lot of reckoning going on, and I think that's good. It reminds us that we are connected. We share certain things as a nation. We share certain things as a global family and to be in a position to share those stories at this stage of the game, it's huge. No, it is huge, yeah. It is absolutely huge. What does it mean to you to lead people here at McLeod Plantation, given your personal heritage and what you know about the history here? It's emotional, uh, I'll be honest with you. Um, there are days when I struggle with what happened. And then I think about, but they live through it, they push through it, and I owe it to them to do the same. So to be their voice just means everything. Well, the work you're doing is so important. I, I think being in a place with someone and getting that face-to-face -face contact and hearing it firsthand is really, really special. Thank you so much. It's, it's really an honor to welcome the world here. And the world does come here. It is extraordinary. Last April, people from 95 countries walked these grounds. So there's something happening here and we're, we're just happy to be a part of it. Back in Charleston, I'm reuniting with Corey Alston for dinner a local artist who is a direct descendant of a Gullah Geechee family. I met Corey in the Charleston City Market on my last trip to Charleston. He's joining me for a meal at Leon's Oyster Shop to share more about Gullah Geechee influences on food in Charleston. Welcome back to Charleston. So should we dive into the oyster first? Let's try one. Let's try one. Yes. Let's do it. That's good. Boy, that is so good. Yeah. So fresh. Well, we have the harbor, you know, and so Gullah people, for example, we say don't eat an oyster out of the Arma. We'll start them here right around, let's say, October, and we'll stop having local oysters, let's say, around the month of April. So you like hush puppies? I love hush puppies, and I grew up having them in um, Myrtle Beach. In the Gullah culture, we have some legends of where the hush puppy even came from. As the enslaved uh, Africans were, were, were trying to escape using an underground railroad system, this fried dough ball would have been used as a 
item to throw the dog dogs off. And so the, the enslavers would have been coming behind the dogs, and then that dog would have been over there eating a hush puppy, totally thrown off the scent. So it was more called a hush puppy, and that's how the, the legends kept alive. And so eating one here in the South is definitely a Southern tradition. It's crunchy and salty on the outside, moist on the inside, and that butter is a nice, sweet compliment. Yeah, this is good These stuff. are good hush puppies. Less than 30 minutes outside of Charleston, we're visiting a National Historic Landmark. Middleton Place has survived tumultuous time periods, including the Revolutionary War and Civil War. Home to generations of the Middleton family, who played prominent roles in South Carolina during colonial times. Travelers today can visit Middleton Place and America's oldest landscape gardens. So, Sydney, you must have a very, 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 very green thumb, <laughs> having been here for 50 years? About 49 years now. Well, yeah. almost 50. Almost, getting close. <laughs> Sydney Fraser, the vice president of horticulture at Middleton Place, has rightfully been called the king of camellias. You know, people don't think about it, but when they walk through this garden, they're walking on the very path that the Middletons walked on and the guests walked on, and the enslaved Africans walked on. When were camellias actually brought here to Middleton Place? Well, the first camellias were brought by Andre Michaud, the French botanist, in 1786. And there were four of those camellias that were brought. And from that point, we are now up to about 10,000 camellias. Wow. I read that these are some of, if not the oldest, formal gardens in America. What makes it a formal garden? Everything is laid out in a formal, controlled condition. The more control you demonstrate in your landscaping, the more power you demonstrate. It was the planters demonstrating power against one another. I have a larger plantation than you do. I have more slaves than you do. So that's where the power demonstration came in. But you know something we never think about? The first horticulturists were the enslaved Africans, and they were brought for the knowledge that they had. Everything that we see out here is the bones of the garden, all done by enslaved Africans. History is history, and I think we need to realize that it is history, and we can learn from history. So much to learn. We're traveling to Berkeley County to visit another site that's an architectural and historical gem, St. Stephen's Episcopal Church. Built in the 1760s, it's one of only a few surviving 18th century brick parish churches in the state. Shanda Phillips shares its unique architectural features and importance from the time period. This is in the Georgian style, which yes. we have that nice, beautiful symmetry. Yes. So one thing that you'll see is all the fan lights above the window. That was a common piece because, again, in colonial times, they believed that you're letting the light of God's word into the church. So you'll notice in Anglican churches that the pulpit is to the left. This is original. This was built by William Anson. And this is solid mahogany. So if you look, you think about all of that being hand carved. The today's world, that's very different to think that that's hand carved. Mm -hmm. St. Stephen's Church has a history of welcoming diverse populations, including back in colonial times. This church is unique in that it had a subscription that you paid for a pew. So it's like tickets to uh, your box seats at the, yes. at the baseball game. Yes. But then in the gallery section, there were free pews. Any free people, anyone who could not afford, indentured servants and slaves were allowed to sit in the free pews in the gallery. So that was more unusual for the time. Yes, it was. So today, the church still has an active congregation. We have a Sunday morning service. This is the only colonial church in the area that still has that weekly service. Huh, a little church that has survived from colonial times to the present and is still active. That's yes. very rare. Yes, it is. It's very rare. Something we're very proud of, too. During the American Revolution, soldiers had to contend with the challenging landscapes of South Carolina's low country, including in the swamps in and around Monk's Corner. At the old Santee Canal Park, park director Brad Sale is taking me on a walk to get a closer look at those swamps. So we're here at Old Santee Canal Park. It's the site of the first true canal built in America. It's also 150 acre swamp. So we have four miles of trails, boardwalks, canoe rentals to kind of explore history and nature at the same time. 
The Santee Canal opened in 1800 to connect the Santee River with the Cooper River, allowing for travel by water to Charleston Harbor. Surveys for the canal project date back to the 1770s, but the American Revolution put those plans on hold for decades. Well, I'm looking around at this terrain right now. I'm glad we're up on these boards because <laughs> I don't know how you would travel through the swamp any other way. The trees with these cypress knees, it's not easy. Snakes, alligators, all of those treacherous things that we think about in a swamp. But think about, you know, the swamp fox Fr Francis Marion moving through here. General Francis Marion, the swamp fox, was one of the directors of the incorporated company for opening this inland navigation route between the Santee and Cooper rivers. The old Santee Canal Park today is also a great place to get into nature. The rain isn't necessarily good for humans, but it's great for amphibians. So I hear some pig frogs, some green frogs that are all out there. They really love this warm, wet spring day. So the swamp is great even in the rain. These are sounds that a lot of historic figures have actually used for their benefit. Yeah, yeah. A common bird to hear here in the swamp is a barred owl. It's got a great place in history where Harry Tubman would uh, mimic barred owl calls in the swamp. It's a common animal in the swamp to hear. It's a good way to communicate without being noticed. And she would use that to communicate during the Underground Railroad. Old Santee Canal Park is also home to educational programs for kids and resources for adults, like the Interpretive Center and Museum and Heritage Center, which chronicles South Carolina's nature and history, including the many American Indian tribes who lived along the coast and further inland in South Carolina. Lisa Collins, the chief of the Wasimasaw tribe of Varnertown Indians, is walking the trails surrounding the Berkeley County Museum with me to share more about her tribe's history in South Carolina. We are a simulation of different native lines, eight in fact, and two of those came from the coastal region, which is the Edisto Indian line and the Etowan. So our ancestors are descendants of those native people. What happened during this tumultuous time of the American Revolution? You know, Native American people didn't think it was our fight. We have those that sided with the Loyalists and those that sided with the Patriots. That's how we fought, and it was more for our ancestral land protection, more than believing in a cause. Despite losing their ancestral lands, descendants have been serving in military conflicts from the Revolution on. Now Lisa is making sure that that history isn't forgotten through an oral history project. We've been working to capture that history and they're coming out and recording our elders and asking those questions about history. You can't change the past and you can't change history, but you sure can make a better direction for your community and your descendants. And that's what our people are trying to do, to make sure that generations to come will have access to our history, to our culture, and be proud of the people they descend from. Our final stop is to visit the gravesite of Francis Marion, the descendant of French Huguenot immigrants. Marion was born and laid to rest in Berkeley County. Keith Gordine, who has spent years studying local Revolutionary War battles and Francis Marion, speaks about the importance of the tomb and memorial, erected at his gravesite 100 years after Marion's death. The tomb was, was placed here by the state of South Carolina in 1893. When they had the unveiling of the uh, monument, there were over 1,000 people that came here. And getting here, when there was only the old river road, that was all that there was, you know, and they came into St. Stephen, a lot of them by train, and then a lot of the uh, villagers in Pineville took their wagons, buggies, hmm. brought them here. It was, I'm sure it was, I'd love to have been here. <laughs> I take a few minutes to read the inscription on Marion's tomb. History will record his worth and rising generations embalm his memory as one of the most distinguished patriots and heroes of the American Revolution. I can't help but think about the many unsung heroes who locals have shared as we've traveled throughout the state of South Carolina, including the modern historians and keepers of oral history who've shared insights into people and communities whose stories didn't capture the headlines or make it into the classroom history books. It's one reason why traveling to historic sites in modern times is so important. History is still being uncovered, and by learning about our collective past, 
we can chart a better future. Thanks for watching Travels with Darlie, and thanks for joining us on this revolutionary road trip adventure. But for nature, they love the uh, swamp. It's really raining. <laughs> it's raining even harder now. Yeah. You can definitely hear that, I'm sure, in the mic. When it rains, it pours. <laughs> no, let's not. Let's go to the gin house. Oh, okay. Let's go Is to the gin, gin house. <laughs> we might need some Not gin after the gin this. you have in mind. <laughs> That's a wrap. <laughs>